Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. This week's lesson is titled Mission to the Needy. It's ready for teaching on November 25 and comes from the series God's Mission, Our Mission. Your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 18. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've heard the story of the rich young ruler. We've heard the story of the Good Samaritan. And Lord, we just thank you that in your word, not only do we have these stories, but we have the messages that come from them, that we as individuals, we as a church, have an opportunity to share your love and your grace with those around us in both practical and spiritual ways. And Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray for your blessing on us, wherever we're listening, in all the corners of the earth, listening to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson this week. We just want to thank you that your Holy Spirit can guide us and bless us as we open your word. May it speak to us so well today that we will know that Jesus is our Saviour and we are his representatives here and that we can at any time cast our cares upon you. And today I'd like to pray for Joan Skinner and for Kili Kip Kirui and uh, Esther and Sharono, part of her family, and Cheryl and Alvarado Gatinio and family. And from Kenya, um, Kenya Harisi and her son and Nelson and also her extended family. And Nokuzola Ramingwana, um, who is battling poverty, and there is problems in with the family with alcohol and drugs, and a recent court case. Lord, we just pray that your hand will be there, that that your comfort will be there, and the strength that you can give will be available to that family and to each one of us as we open your word this week. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew twenty-five and verse forty. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Let's read that again, Matthew 25 and verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Luke 5, 17 to 26 provides many illustrations of how God is helping those in need. Sometimes God uses others to help us, or he uses us to help others. This work can be challenging, but it brings great rewards. By helping those in need, we are modelling the ministry of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's easy to tell who is in need of help, At other times, it is difficult to know. Whatever the situation, we are called to be God's helpers for all people in need, regardless of their background. Let's read Luke 5, verses 17 to 26. Now, it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, They went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately 
he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Whatever the situation, we are called to be God's helpers for all people in need, regardless of their background. The Bible encourages us to draw close to strangers, and by winning their confidence, we can learn better ways of helping them find Jesus. In this week's lesson, our topic, Mission to the Needy, shows that God has a plan to reach those who might be needy in any number of ways. Their needs might be physical, emotional, financial, or even social. That is, some might be deemed as outcasts from their community or family. Whatever the needs are, we must be ready to do what we can to help. This is a central part of what it means to be a Christian and what mission must include. Sunday, November 19, The Faith of Friends A powerful story in the Gospels reveals what some men went through in order to bring a needy person, probably a friend, to Jesus. We can learn from what happened here about the hard work it might sometimes take to minister to those in need. Read Luke 5, verses 17 to 26, also Matthew 9, 1 to 8, and Mark 2, verses 3 to 12. What are some of the lessons we can take from this story about mission and ministry? First of all, Luke 5, beginning at verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easy to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And Matthew 9, beginning at verse 1. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then, behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now, when the multitudes saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. And then Mark 2, beginning at verse 3. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic, who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, 
Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. By bringing their friend to Jesus, these men took on the responsibility to care for him. God is calling us to be like this man's friends, to lead the needy to Jesus Christ. This work requires faith, action, patience, and a willingness, if need be, to be unconventional. The men came to Jesus but encountered barriers. They could not bring their helpless friend to Jesus through traditional means. They did not give up. Instead, they found an innovative way of getting the man to Jesus Christ dropping their friend down from the roof. Yet, according to Luke, Jesus approved of what they did, as we see in Luke chapter 5 and verse 20. And that reads, When he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus' desire is for us to bring our helpless friends to him. The Bible refers to Jesus as the great physician who longs to forgive and heal those who are suffering, whoever they are. Ellen G. White challenges us to help the helpless. She writes in Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 29, Do not wait to be told your duty. Open your eyes and see who are around you. Make yourselves acquainted with the helpless, afflicted and needy. Hide not yourselves from them and seek not to shut out their needs. Who gives the proofs mentioned in James of possessing pure religion, untainted with selfishness or corruption? Who are anxious to do all in their power to aid in the great plan of salvation? End of quote. Jesus himself demonstrates how to help the helpless and is calling us to do the same. First, we become their friends. Then we learn about their needs. And finally, we lead them to Jesus, who is the only one who can help them. This is what the men in this story did. We need to do likewise in whatever situation we find ourselves. Help lead people to the only one who can save them. Jesus. And so to finish today, who around you right now needs some help? What are you going to do for them? Monday, November 20, Christ's Method Alone. What do the following stories teach us about ministry to the needy? First of all, we'll read John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up to the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. 
and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And then in Mark chapter 1, verse 23 to 28, Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Ellen G. White provides a five-step process of Jesus' method in how to minister, especially to those in need. Christ's method alone, she writes in the Ministry of Healing, page 143, will give success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Let's read that through one more time. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. End of quote. First, we must mingle with the helpless, spend time getting to know them and understand their needs with the intention of doing good for them. Look at what Jesus did with the paralytic at the pool. Jesus was right there amid the great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralysed, we read in John 5 verse 3. Second, we need to show sympathy. This can be challenging in some cases because of distrust and because sometimes people use kindness as a means of winning the confidence of someone whom they later abuse. Nevertheless, God is calling us to show sympathy without expecting anything in return. The third step is to minister to their needs. This involves more than just words. It takes action to minister to the needs of a friend or a stranger. Jesus spoke with the paralytic, asked what he wanted, and then worked a miracle in his behalf. In the story of the man possessed by an unclean spirit, Jesus took complete control of the situation, doing for the helpless man what he could not do for himself. The fourth step is winning their confidence. When we minister to people... When we help them, they will learn to trust us and what we say to them. So, when we talk to them about Jesus, they would be more open to listen. Jesus didn't want just to heal them physically. He wanted them to have eternal life in him. As we read in John chapter 10 and verse 10, and that reads, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The last step is to help lead them to Jesus, an act that requires faith from both you and the one whom you help. And so to finish today, we generally can't do the kind of miracles that Jesus did, but what are ways that we can still minister to those who need help? Tuesday, November 21, Refugees and Immigrants The topic of immigrants and refugees has become a hotly debated subject, especially because there are so many of them today. Whether displaced by war, natural disasters, or for the hope of a better economic future, millions around the world have been uprooted from their homes and are in desperate need of help. 
In Matthew 2, verses 13 and 14, Jesus was a refugee. Let's read that. Matthew 2, beginning at verse 13. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. His earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, were forced to flee Bethlehem by night and seek refuge in Egypt to escape the murderous hand of Herod. The Bible says nothing about their experience in Egypt, but it's not hard to imagine that it had its challenges. Perhaps some of the same challenges that refugees face today as well. In fact, somewhat parallel to how Jesus' family sought asylum in a foreign land, many Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Christians and non-religious persons are seeking asylum in new lands today as well. Generally speaking, it is easier to make friends with individuals from our own culture and language group because we share many things in common. It is more challenging, however, to find common ground with immigrants and refugees who look different from us, who do not speak our language, who do not share the same religious values and do not eat similar food. The gospel calls us to get out of our ethnic, national and cultural comfort zones and to reach out to those in need, regardless of how different from us they might be. Read Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19, Psalm 146, verse 9, Romans 12, 13, and Leviticus 23, verse 22. What's the important theme here for us to remember? Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 19, Therefore love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Psalm 146 verse 9 The Lord watches over the strangers, he relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. Romans 12 verse 13 Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Leviticus 23 verse 22 When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. How can we minister to immigrants and refugees? It is difficult because in some countries it may not be politically correct to mingle with or help these people. Yet we must do what we can, when we can, to minister to these people who surely have been through some very difficult times and are in need of our help. So, to whatever degree we can, we must help. Begin with prayer, then seek information on immigrants and refugees. Many places have organisations that care for them. You can begin working with one of these organisations, or maybe your local church Sabbath school could start a ministry for immigrants or refugees. And so to finish the day, even if it's only a small amount, what can you do to help any immigrants or refugees you know about? Wednesday, November 22, to help the hurting. Who among us hasn't experienced just how hurting our world really is? Whether living in an environment of wealth and materialism or living in an environment of poverty and material needs, it doesn't matter. People are hurting, suffering, struggling. All one has to do, for instance, is read about the staggering amount of money spent on antidepressants in the Western world each year to understand that material wealth alone does not even come close to guaranteeing happiness or peace. As we read in Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. 
What does this teach us about what Jesus did and what we too in our own sphere should be doing for those in need around us? God is calling us to meet the needs of all people, even though we don't know when or if they will ever accept Jesus. Though reaching them for Jesus is the foundation of our mission, we need to help those in need purely because they need help. We help them because we have accepted Jesus as our Lord, and that is what he calls us to do. Jesus' example of trying to meet the needs of all people is a biblical principle to follow. We don't know if everyone whom he helped accepted him or not. To truly help others, we need to become aware of their needs. Every culture has its own way of showing how to treat a friend. In India, it is customary to serve food or a drink when entertaining visitors. It is easier to give a stranger token money than to comfort a friend who just lost a loved one. What your friend may need may be more than money or physical things. Often, your sympathetic support during the time of a major loss could be much more helpful. The important principle of being Jesus' helper to our friends begins first with the goal of showing selfless love toward them, understanding their needs first before trying to offer help. Provide the help they need even though you may not know if they are ready to follow Jesus. And finally, for today, read Matthew 25 verses 34 to 40. What's the message for us? Here, Matthew 25, beginning at verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Thursday, November 23. Greater Love. As we all know and know too well, the needs never end. If you are willing to help others, you will have plenty of opportunities. Whether close friends or refugees far away, people are in need and we should do what we can when we can to help. All through his earthly ministry, Jesus helped those who could not help themselves. In some cases, he took the initiative and went to those in need. In other cases, as with the men who lowered the paralytic from the roof in order to bring him to Jesus, friends took the initiative. As it says in John 15 verse 13, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. How do we apply this principle in our ministry to others? One missionary family served six years in Trinidad and Tobago. The first three years they lived in a predominantly Hindu and Muslim community. Many Hindus complained that Christians refused their invitation to the annual Thanksgiving service. One day, these Christians attended a Thanksgiving service of a new Hindu friend. They did this following Jesus' example. He visited his friends when they invited him to their special celebrations. In fact, Hinduism teaches that visitors or friends bring blessings to the home of the host. Let's make an attempt to begin making a friend this week by being a blessing to someone. First, survey your context, community, village or city. Do you know of any refugee or immigrant living there? How about the people that live on your street? Do you know them all? Regardless of your situation, making friends with a stranger is not an easy task. Let's pray and ask God for help. He knows everyone and knows the stranger that you can become friends with. Remember, the goal is to be their friend so that 
you can help by leading them to God for help. And that brings us to challenge. Learn about foreigners or non-Christians who live in your country. JoshuaProject.net is a good place to survey unreached people groups in your culture. The actual address is JoshuaProject.net. There is no S. It's in the singular. JoshuaProject.net. And challenge up. Identify someone within your sphere of influence. Begin regularly praying for the person after answering the following questions. 1. Is this person my friend, according to Jesus' model of friendship? 2. Do I know the needs of his or her life? And 3. How can I lead him or her to Jesus for healing? Friday, November 24. The Gospel writers recorded examples of Jesus' practice of building bridges with people from other cultures in order to save them. Matthew 8, verses 28 to 34. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them there were a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So, when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to see Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart, from their region, and we also look at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you, by God, that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There was about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim it in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marvelled. Likewise, 
we also are called to make friends and minister to people from other cultures as well. Christ's death was for everyone, regardless of race, nationality, wealth or background. This is a point we must never forget. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world, we read in 1 John 2, verse 2. Ellen White writes in Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, October 15, 1895. Men and women are not fulfilling the design of God when they simply express affection for their own family circle, while they exclude those from their love whom they could comfort and bless by relieving their necessities. When the Lord bids us do good for others outside our home, He does not mean that our affection for home shall become diminished and that we shall love our kindred or our country less because He desires us to extend our sympathies. But we are not to confine our attention and sympathy within four walls and enclose the blessing that God has given us so that others will not be benefited with us in its enjoyment. End of quote. The responsibility given to us to be a blessing to those outside our comfort zone, whether they are from another culture or just a helpless person, is a non-negotiable mandate from Jesus Christ himself, as you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And he also said in Mark eleven seventeen, Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. What is your own comfort zone? And why must you be willing to step outside of it when necessary? 2. What are the implications of the incident when Jesus was called a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners in Matthew 11:19? What was Jesus doing that would have brought that accusation and what does it teach us about mission? And three, to what extent should a Christian engage in the celebrations of non-believers? How might Christians do that without compromising biblical principles? Mission Path to Spain, Part 2 by Andrew McChesney Only five families were at home when gunmen descended on a cluster of nine houses occupied by Seventh-day Adventist pastoral families in Venezuela. Waving weapons, the attackers forced the families into a single house where they separated the men, women and children. Police arrived and surrounded the house, leading to a standoff that ended peacefully ten hours later when, at 3am, the gunmen fled into a forest behind the house. The wives and children of the nine pastoral families were relocated after the 2016 attack. The pastors worked alone for several months as they waited for new placements. Several moved to other countries to serve as pastors. Louis Paver, who had served as a pastor for about a decade, wasn't sure what to do. Life had been difficult in economically volatile Venezuela before the attack. Money was tight and food was scarce. For three years he had been struggling to pay off a loan. But he couldn't even keep up with the interest payments and the debt had swelled to US dollars the hostage-taking was the breaking point for Louis's wife. The family of five had not been at home at the time of the attack, but his wife was left traumatised and she didn't want to live in Venezuela any more. Louis agreed that the country wasn't safe, but he didn't feel right about leaving an unpaid debt. Louis prayed for a sign. He didn't usually ask for signs because he believed that God could lead without them, but he didn't know what else to do. Lord, if you work a miracle and help me pay this debt, that will be the sign for me to leave Venezuela, he prayed. The gunman had stolen things from all nine houses, including Louis. Being robbed was not unusual. Louis's home had been broken into many times over the past year, but he had not filed any insurance claims. Usually the thefts were too small to make them worth pursuing a claim. 
But after the last theft, church leaders offered compensation for everything stolen over the past year if Louis obtained a stamped police report confirming the latest theft. None of the other pastors were able to get the police report, but Louis happened to have friends in the police force, and he secured the document. Two months later, the insurance company deposited $1,000 in his bank account. It was the exact amount needed to pay the debt. I didn't benefit from that money, said Louis, who is a missionary in Spain today, but I understand that God sent the money so I could pay off the debt. I knew that God also would bless the plan to leave the country. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offering that helps support missionaries around the world. Next week we will read about how Louis flew from Mexico to Spain. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful.